So we have a generic equation here. Uh, so let's just set up uh, our, our plan of attack here. So our plan of attack is to, to assume that your solution is some exponential function, since it always seems like it's an exponential function a lot. Exponential functions have been coming up a lot, haven't you noticed? All right, <clears throat> so once we get over that idea, let's assume that your solution looks like uh, e to the m times x. All right, so given that, let's, let's put it back into this equation and find the first and second derivatives, put it in there and see what, what kind of thing we're going to get. So we have, uh, we need y prime, which is e to the mx times m, and then y double prime, which is going to be m squared e to the mx. And then we just plop those down into y double prime and y prime. We're going to get a times uh, m squared e to the mx. That's your y double prime. b times y prime, which is m e to the mx. And then c times y, which is just e to the mx. And we want this thing to equal to 0. <coughs> Now, if you notice, the e to the mx occurs in all of them. And if you also notice, e to the mx can never be equal to 0. So really, I can just divide that out. We have issues with dividing by terms, factors that might be equal to 0. But e to the mx will never equal to 0. So I'm going to write it down right now, but I'm going to cross it out when I say I'm going to divide it. So I have a times m squared plus b times m plus c all equal to 0. And if we divide out by e to the mx, it's still going to equal to 0. This. Is your characteristic equation. Now, the book, I think, calls it auxiliary equation or something. I'm going to call it characteristic. Or maybe I'll call it auxiliary. Yeah, doesn't matter what we call it. But we know that there's going to be a simple, this is simple, right? You could do this. We know that there is a simple polynomial that we're going to solve for. It's a second order. It's a quadratic polynomial. And you have total control over that. Total control. You know exactly what's going to happen. You know what to expect. And if we cut to the chase, <laughs> forgot. There are many songs written about this. I, I don't know any of them. All right, total control. <clears throat> we know that there are three possibilities here. Uh, we know that uh, the discriminant over here is b squared minus 4ac. We know when the discriminant is positive, we have two real roots. When b is exactly equal to 0, or when the discriminant, sorry, when the discriminant is exactly equal to 0, we have uh, one repeated root. And when the discriminant is less than 0, then we have a negative under the square root, which means we have complex numbers. And these roots, if they're two complex numbers, they happen to be complex conjugates. You guys know what complex conjugates are? 
x plus i y and x minus i y are complex conjugates of each other. So basically the real part is the same. The imaginary part has an opposite sign. That's what it means for them to be complex conjugates. And so the plus and minus over here tells you that one's going to be plus, one, plus something i, one's going to be minus something i, but it's the same number y, whether it's plus and minus, so that's how you get the complex conjugates. Okay? So we got two real roots. One repeated root or two complex roots. <clears throat> All right. That's it. We're done. All right. Maybe we should do some examples. Um, so let's take a look at each of these cases and see how they develop. Uh, and let's do that with an actual example for each. So. I need to come up with an example and make sure they factor. <laughs> Give me a quadratic that factors. That factors into, into two distinct roots, real roots. What if I say y prime plus 2y. No, I think I need to put the... I think this will work. Let's try this. <coughs> okay? Now, we can pretend we're going through the auxiliary equation to, to find the auxiliary equation, but we know what the auxiliary equation is, right? Characteristic. <coughs> so the characteristic equation will be m squared minus m minus 2 is equal to 0. See where I got that? Just look at the coefficients, right? Instead of y double prime, I'll just say m squared. And then instead of y, I'll have 1 there. It's like 2 times 1. Okay? And I think the way I got this set up was I got to set up the factor, right? So does it factor correctly? Minus 2 and plus 1. So had I used a quadratic equation, I would have gotten two real roots in this case. And these are my two real roots. m is equal to 2, and m is equal to negative 1. So my solutions. will be y equals e to the 2x, because m is equal to 2. And then another y equals e to the minus x. Wait, I have two solutions. Oh, yeah, this is a second order differential equation, so I should have two solutions. So maybe I'll call it y1 and y2. You can pass this through the Ronskian to show that they're actually linearly independent, or you can just believe me.
And so each of these would be called a fundamental solution according to our definitions, which means if I take the first and second derivatives and I put it into the function, I should get this to work out. And so if we have two linearly independent solutions as our fundamental solution for our second order differential equation, then we have a complete set. And so your general solution or your differential equation is going to be y is equal to the first fundamental solution times a constant and then another constant times a second fundamental solution. Okay? That's it. We're done. This is where math becomes fun again. Right? All you're doing is quadratic equation. Hey, I know that. Let's put it together. Of course, you should check. Make sure it's right. It's right. Okay, we good? All right, first case. The first case is easy. Isn't that always the case? After that, it's just going to go down. <laughs> then we're going to not like math again. All right, all based on the characteristic equation. Ready for the next one? All right, let's go to the next problem. So case two, let's say we had one repeated root. Let's see if I can make up an equation with one repeated root. Uh, minus two X, well, let's call it two Y prime plus Y equals zero. <clears throat> All right, ready? So, characteristic equation m squared minus 2m plus 1 is equal to 0. So I think m is equal to 1 would work here, uh, but that's the only solution. But technically, it's a repeated root. So, so if it's a repeated root, I need two fundamental solutions for this because I'm looking at a second order differential equation. If I want a repeated root, can my first fundamental solution be equal to e to the 1 times x and my second one be equal to e to the 1 times x again. Can I have this as my two fundamental solutions? No. Why not? Why can't we have both of these as my fundamental solutions? They're not linearly independent. They're the exact same function. So you can't have the, you know, linearly independent means you can write them C, I don't want to use C1, uh, alpha, alpha 1 e to the x plus alpha 2 e to the x is equal to 0. That means I could choose, um, I can only choose zeros for alpha 1 and alpha 2, but can I choose a non-zero alpha 1 and alpha 2 to make this equation true? 
Yeah, just make one positive and one negative. Doesn't matter what the number is. So alpha is alpha one is equal to one, alpha two is equal to negative one, and then I have a true equation. So these are linearly dependent. So I can't use the e to the x, because I already have e to the x as a one fundamental solution. I can't repeat that as my second fundamental solution. So now I have to go find another solution. So, how? Need another solution that is linearly independent. How do I find another solution? Wait a minute, what did we talk about last time? Hmm? We talked about something last time, didn't we? <laughs> the reduction of order. Uh, given a solution to a differential equation, find another solution by substitution and reducing the order. So suppose y1 of x, let's just say that's e to the x, is a solution to a differential equation, then u of x equals to y1 of x is also a solution. Hmm. <laughs> For this one. All right. Is it the same differential equation as last time? Okay. <laughs> All right, let's take this piece of information here. Break it down a little bit. <coughs> so, to find another solution that's linearly independent, <coughs> uh, y is equal to u of x times e to the x is our other solution. Actually, our other solution is, uh, yeah, we have to figure out what u of x is equal to and then solve for this thing. So what do we need to do? We need to find a couple of derivatives and put it into this equation and see what happens. So y prime is equal to, uh, instead of writing u of x, I'll just put u. So derivative of the first times the second plus the first times the derivative of the second. Oh, I don't know. Should it just be x? <laughs> yeah. <coughs> All right, so y double prime is u double prime e to the x plus u prime e to the x. So that's a product rule for the first, the product rule for the second one, u prime e to the x plus u e to the x. So it looks like these two can come together. All right, we'll put it back into the differential equation up here. 
So our double prime is u double prime e to the x plus 2 u prime e to the x plus u e to the x. Is there a constant? Minus 2. And then the y prime is u prime e to the x plus u e to the x. And then the y is just by itself plus y u e to the x. So let's gather all the u's together. There's two here, and there's two here for the primes, and that's gone. That disappears. And then there's one here for the u's. There's one here. There's no negative two of that, and then there's one more. So that all disappears. By the way, it doesn't always turn out like this. I know our last example from uh, last week, when we did reduction of order, we got this really simple um, separable differential equation and stuff. Not even, I don't even know if we should call it separable. It's like a calc 2 problem. So if I divide by e to the x, which I can because it'll never be equal to 0, I essentially have this. Take the integral one time, and remember you can call it a constant, but we're just ignore the c's for this. And then u without the primes would just be x. <coughs> so that's your u. So your other solution. We'll call it y2 is going to be u, which we found to be x, times the first fundamental solution. So it turns out that x e to the x is a solution to this differential equation as well. I invite you to check this, but I'm not going to because. I want to move on. <clears throat> so the general solution is going to be the linear combination of those two fundamental solutions. We have the fundamental solution e to the x. We have the fundamental solution x e to the x that we just found. And so a linear combination just means put constants in front of them and add them together. So our general solution is y is equal to c1 e to the x plus c2 times x e to the x. <clears throat> and this is what you're going to do. You don't need to do all this mess, so let me circle, highlight what you don't have to do all the time. Basically, once you know that you have a repeated root, your second fundamental solution is just going to have an x in front of it. It's the same e to the whatever power, except you'll have an x in front of it. Always, for second order. If it's a higher order, then things may change. Eh, eh a little bit. Okay. We got two down. We got one more to go. The last one deals with complex numbers, so Mr. Euler is going to have to step in here and help us out.
All right, let's take a look at the last case. This is a really simple case. Should I do a really simple case? Or medium? Medium. I, was, I really like this because this is the one on your test and it's easy and I know the answers already. All right, this uh, doesn't have any real roots, so I must be expecting two complex roots, right? Characteristic equation. M squared plus M plus one equals zero. Negative one plus or minus the square root of one minus four AC divided by two. So I have two solutions. It's negative one half plus or minus square root of three over two times the imaginary number because the stuff under the square root is negative. Okay. Now let's just take one of them. There's two of them, right? They're complex conjugates. There's a plus and minus business over here that makes them a complex conjugate. So there's two complex numbers that we're dealing with. Let's focus on one complex number and we'll see that if we apply the same kind of work that we do for that first complex number and the second complex number will yield us the same, uh, not exactly the same, but some linearly dependent functions. So we can really get all our information from one of them. So let's choose M. Is equal to one half plus root three over two i. And remember, our function is y is equal to e to the mx, right? So this is what your m is equal to. So your fundamental solution is e to the one half plus root three over two i times x. Because that's what your M is equal to. Now, <clears throat> we start off with real problem, real as in real numbers. We start off with a problem dealing with real numbers. And so we're going to want our solutions to be with real numbers. And we have a complex number here. But the complex numbers, a couple of things about complex numbers. One, they're just constants. They're scalars. You can think about them as scalars. And two, I don't know if there is a two. Maybe it's just one. Anyways, we know some properties of exponential functions or just exponents in general. We can distribute the x. And then we can split up the sum into 
a product of two of the, two of the same exponents with the same base. Right? All right, Mr. Euler says that if we have an exponential function or exponential expression with an imaginary number as part of the power, we could take a look at that coefficient next to the imaginary number as an argument for the sine and cosine. Okay, I'm not going to prove Euler's formula because that could be or was done or could have been done in your Calc 2 class and we saw a quick proof and if you want to just Google or YouTube uh, Euler's formula with uh, series then you can see a more formal proof or a semi-formal proof like Mr. Sal Khan did in his video. But I'm just going to use it and say well according to Euler's formula this e to the i theta is equal to the cosine of that angle plus i times the sine of that same angle. Now I'm wondering how many functions are involved here. I have an exponential function, I have a sine function, I have a cosine function. Oh wait, I can distribute the e to the one half x, right? So what I have here yeah. Isn't that a negative one half? Oh yeah. Let's put a negative there. Thank you. That was an easy fix. Whew. So now I'm looking at a combination of two functions. It looks like a linear combination of two functions, right? It's still imaginary over here. We still have that imaginary number that makes it complex. But if I just ignore that i, i is just a constant, really. I mean, complex, sure, but it's really just a comp constant. And if I just ignore that i, I'm looking at two viable candidates for my fundamental solution. So it looks like I might be able to say that my fundamental solution will be these two, e to the negative one-half x cosine of root three over two x, and then e to the negative one-half x, and then sine root three over two x. We can pass it through the Ronskin to see that these two are linearly independent. And once we know that they're linearly independent, we have two fundamental solutions for a second order differential equation, then we must, we must, we must be done. So then our solution, general solution,
must be the linear combination of these two fundamental solutions. Y is equal to C1 e to the negative 1 half x cosine root 3 over 2 x plus C2 e to the negative 1 half x sine square root of 3 over 2 x. And then that's it. <clears throat> Any questions? Now, we only took the positive part of the conjugate. What happens if we did the negative part of the conjugate? What do you think would happen? Well, without doing it all over again, let me just highlight the things that might change. If we were to change this into a negative. So we change this into a negative, so we would have a negative in front of this exponent. We'd have a negative here and a negative here. Now, cosine of a negative of a number is what? Let me write it down. Is equal to what? It's equal to cosine of that angle as if it were positive. Why? Because cosine is a, an even function. So this negative sign that would have been here would have just changed it back into positive. No big deal. Now what happens when you put a sign, a negative inside of the sine function? Then that would be negative on the outside. It's because sine is an odd function. So that imagine, so let's follow through with the negative. Then this would become negative. But then remember, when we found the fundamental uh, solution set, we ignored this i here, right? Because i is just a constant. Sure, it's imaginary, but it's just a constant. So that negative, that would have changed this into a negative i, would just be another constant. And what I'm really focused on is obtaining the, the actual base function. And I, so I would have the same function here. E to negative x sine positive because of the relationship with the sine, positive root 3 over 2 times x. <clears throat> so that negative sine wouldn't matter. We would get the same result whether we put negative or positive in our e to the x function here. And so this is our result. Okay, that covers the three cases. Done. We got total control over this now. Or not. All right, let's summarize. Should have typed up the summary so I don't have to write it. Because my writing sucks. But you're used to it now, right? By now? <laughs> no. Yeah. That's a summary. Dealing with second order differential equations with constant coefficients. and homogeneous. Okay?
So what do we do? Find the characteristic equation. And then determine what case you're in. So if you have two real roots, we'll call it M1 and M2. Then your general solution would be y equals c1 e to the m1 x or t depends on what your independent variable is plus c2 e to the m2 x. Okay. Case two, if one repeated root we'll call it M, then your general solution will be Y is equal to C one E to the MX plus C2, and remember, by the reduction of order uh, uh, technique that we would have done, we would have got an extra x in there. So C2 times x e to the mx. And then our last case, if we have complex conjugates, and this time I'll use alpha plus beta i for my complex number. Alpha is the real part, the one that doesn't have an imaginary, and beta is the one with the imaginary part. That's called the imaginary part. Your general solution. You can write it a couple of ways. I'll write it by repeating the e to the x. Y is equal to C1. And then your first solution would be e to the alpha x times cosine of beta x plus C2, your second solution will still have e to the alpha x. And then this time you take a look at the sine beta x. So this summarizes the second order linear homogeneous differential equations with constant coefficients. And so you really don't have to do any of that work unless you want to recover or redo the proof of this thing. It's all kind of been done for you. Or unless I ask you in a test or something to do it from scratch. But in general, all you have to do is solve a quadratic equation and then you're pretty much on your way. Any questions? All right. <clears throat> Why don't you guys try this real quick? I'll give you four minutes, three minutes. This is a question from our test. Y double prime plus 4Y is equal to zero. 
and see if you guys get the solution that I said was the solution on the test. Come on in, Bill. If you want to listen to some boring lecture. No. <laughs> got ten more minutes. These guys are trying to do some differential equations right now. I feel the brain waves. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of waves, they're dealing with seismic sometimes. Oh, cool. Little matter of fact. You guys get it? All right, so uh, <coughs> if you look at the solution, it, there's no real part, right? Zero plus or minus two i, if we approach it that way. Uh, so imagine the alpha being zero, we have e to the zero, which is one. So there is no e to the x uh, in, front of that, in front of the solution. So the e to the 0, e to the 0, so that's gone. And then you have your beta as your 2, 2i, two plus or minus 2i. So your beta is equal to 2, so you just have cosine 2x and sine 2x. So you have to take the square root, right, to get to, the, to that value. So we have uh, cosine 2x is one fundamental solution, sine 2x is the other fundamental solution, and just find a linear combination of those, and then you have your general solution. Okay? So I got cosine, or C1 cosine 2x plus C2 sine 2x. Got it? Okay, if you didn't get it, then just try to do that work over again and follow, try to follow this the same, same pattern. 
<laughs> okay. Let us uh, let's just take a quick peek at what happens if it's higher order. It's essentially going to be the same deal. We got higher order as long as we got constant coefficients, and as long as we're dealing with a homogeneous differential equation, then we're still it's still essentially finding the roots for your characteristic equation. So for higher order differential equations. The fundamental theorem of algebra says that whatever, if you have a polynomial, of degree n, so n is equal to 2 or 3 or 5 or 15, whatever the degree is, you have exactly that many roots. Oh, it says here. <laughs> a polynomial in R of degree n will have exactly n roots in the complex plane, counting multiplicity and complex conjugates. Okay, so I bet you guys could do this one. Let's take a look at a third order differential equation. What's a characteristic polynomial? m cubed minus 1 is equal to 0. Hey, look at that. What are the solutions? m is equal to 1. Remember, that's not the only solution. This is a third degree polynomial. We need to come up with three solutions. Right? If it's repeating, we'll count that as repeating. But in this case, it's not repeating. Here are the other two. <clears throat> Should we probably say how we got that, huh? <laughs> might be good. Use Wolfram Alpha. <laughs> oh yeah, that's too bad. <clears throat> okay, there are roots of unity, they call it. And you should have, in the roots of unity, unity comes from the idea that this has radius 1. Of course, it has radius higher, bigger than one. We just, it's the same thing, except it'll move out. I don't know if I want to do it that way. Let's see. Oh, maybe I won't explain it. This is the more complicated one. <coughs> so, um, m is equal to, m cubed is equal to 1, m is equal to 1 to the 1 third power, and then 1 in the complex plane. Is equivalent. The whole reason why it's Euler's formula is being used here is because of, uh, uh, of, of looking at this as if it was in a complex plane where you have the real part and you have the imaginary part. 
and you can pretend that you're working within your unit circle for trig as well. So the angle here is 0 or 2 pi as the angle. So 0 is not going to get us anywhere. So let's pretend that this is an angle of 2 pi. So according to Euler's formula, this number 1 is actually equal to e to the 2 pi i. What's e to the 2 pi i? According to Euler's formula, it's cosine of 2 pi plus i times sine of 2 pi. What's cosine of 2 pi? 1. What's sine of 2 pi? 0. So 1 is equal to 1. So this is one way to think about your, your number. So 1 is the same thing as e to the 2 pi i. So e to the 2 pi i raised to the 1 third power will be my roots. Will be one of my other roots. <coughs> Actually, I think it should have been 2 n pi. <sighs> yeah, l sorry, let me squeeze in an n. Because it turns out that we can get to that number 1 as long as we keep going around the circle, right? We go around the circle, we start at 0, we go around the circle, we go around the circle, we go around the circle, and then we're going to always end up with 1. So we know that from trig, except now we're just kind of using this as a, as a complex plane, so 2n pi. So this is the, this is your solution, and then now when m or when n n is equal to zero, we just have e to the zero, which is one. When n is equal to one, we have two pi divided by three, so that's e to the two pi i divided by 3, which is going to put us with an angle of 2 pi over 3 here, and that's that 1 half, negative 1 half plus root 3 over 2i. And then when we know that we have this as a complex number, our third one is always going to be complex conjugate. Oops. <coughs> so when n is equal to 2, you got m is equal to e to the 4 pi i over 3. which is what this is equal to. Okay? So we have one root that's real, and then we have complex conjugates. Remember that our solution here needs to be, needs to have three fundamental solutions, because it's a third order differential equation. So our fundamental solution would go into these blank spaces. Give me one fundamental solution based on our roots that we found. What? e to the x. From this root, 
m is equal to 1, e to the 1 times x is 1 of your fundamental solutions. Now we got the complex conjugates, so I just need to focus on one of them, and I should be able to fill this in. So what should these ones be? e to the negative one-half x times cosine of root 3 over 2 x. And then, once you know that, then the other one is just the same, except it's a sign. Okay? All right, so if I didn't already fix the homework assignments, the homework assignment for three, or we're in chapter four, for four one and four two, they, they will be due on Sunday. And then today we're starting four three, and that won't be due until next week. Okay? All right, so I'll fix that to be due on Sunday because we technically we covered that last week. Okay, um, I hope this was clear and if it's not clear you should practice it because this is about as easy as it's going to get everything beyond this will be more of a challenge for us so um, get to know this like the back of your hand because this is the basis for studying non-homogeneous differential equations okay all right see you guys next time <laughs>